Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast this week coming to you live from Belfast. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with Anna Tashinsky, Andrew Hunter Murray, and James Harkin. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that during the Festival of Britain in London in 1951, children would deliberately go missing because the local police station where they waited for their parents had the capital's best collection of comic books. <laughs> That's incredible. This was a huge big deal. 1951, this is the Festival of Britain, probably the last massive festival we had in the UK before the Millennium Dome was built. Mm. Uh, and this... <laughs> Don't laugh at the... <laughs> <laughs> it, was a very, it was a huge success in some measures. <laughs> Number of domes. <laughs> Yeah, um, But yeah, the um, Festival of Britain, it was an amazing thing. They had all these incredible buildings and structures and exhibitions all over the UK, in London, in, in uh, uh, Edinburgh, in Belfast, in fact. They did have quite a lot here. Um, but then it was in 1951, and by 1952, the entire thing had been demolished. There was no TV really in those days. It was really the early days of TV. And so these days, I think it's quite forgotten, the Festival yeah. of Britain. Um, yeah. But when you look into it, it was absolutely amazing. And, and what's extraordinary about it as well, so it was the South Bank in London where the Royal Festival Hall is now, which is a very iconic venue, and I've been there many, many times, didn't realise it was built for the Festival of Britain. It was part of the big structure. So the whole of this South Bank, right along the Thames, was just turned into this place of the future. And when you, when you see pictures of it, it is extraordinary what yeah, was there. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And it was built basically to cheer people up a bit after a little war-type episode, wasn't it? A little run-in with the Germans. A, little, a small <laughs> run-in, and it seems like it worked. It seemed to be pretty successful. So they had... My favourite piece of the Festival of Britain was the... Um, like, one of the centrepieces was the Guinness Festival clock, oh, yeah. which oh. was... It was in um, Battersea Park. It was 25 feet high. It said it was the most complicated clock mechanism for 300 years. Which, what happened to what? clocks 300 years earlier? <laughs> where they just, they just forgot how to make them properly. But it was amazing. What I quite like about the Guinness Festival clock is nowhere is it explained why this, one of these centrepieces of the Great Exhibition, was something that is made by an Irish company, which, I don't know if you know this, Belfast, uh, was not part of the United Kingdom at that time. <laughs> and <laughs> Nor is it now. And by two Polish designers. And it's never mentioned, but it sounds incredible. So they had the whole Guinness menagerie. So, you know, back in the olden days, Guinness was advertised by all these animals. Like There was a toucan, wasn't there? Toucan's yep. the big toucan. one, the main yep. event, yeah. They had a crocodile, they had a pelican, a bear, a lion, a kinkajou, all these typically oh, British... What? classic Sorry. kinkajou. A kinkajou, you know. Kinkajou. Yeah, you see them wandering up the South Bank sometimes. It's a real British... It's some kind of South American... Do you American... mean Pikachu? Yes. <laughs> they had Pikachu. <laughs> Uh, it's it's what, like a weird-looking mammal, a cute South American mammal. Yeah. Which, what kind? What kind of mammal? Like a bird or uh, no, a... like a. <laughs> Sorry, back. Wait. Hang no, on. No, 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 no. You can't no, pull I... that back, Dan. <laughs> so, Anna, what kind of mammal? Like a lizard or like a fish or a. <laughs> it was an insect, but. What kind of mammal are we talking about? <laughs> oh fuck! Because he made that joke, it's going to stay in the show now. And yeah. Then... That was always going to stay at the show the moment that left your mouth, I'm afraid. <laughs> I suspect it's not the last you're going to hear of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, so now we all know birds aren't mammals. Great. You're welcome, everyone else at home who had to have me take the bullet to get that bit of information yeah, out yeah. there. We've all learned something today. Okay. They're, and they all danced around. So what every was it, though? Like, did, did we find out? Was it like a spider? It looks, it looks a bit like it? a sloth. <laughs> It's a little... looks a bit like a sloth. Uh, like yeah. a cute, slothy type, um, like a possum or something. Okay, okay. It looks a bit like that. Great. The furry thing. Okay. Um, anyway, nice they thing. jumped out of this clock and danced around constantly, and the ostrich would come out, which had beer glass Not a mammal. Uh, Part of the bird family, <laughs> yeah. I believe. 
Is it? Very strong. Cool. Um, um, yeah, it was very cool. On the other, so the, I mean, there was so much stuff in London, but it did. It was genuinely uh, all all across the country. So, 18 million people across uh, the UK went to one or other of the events that were local. It had the Festival of Britain had its own ship, which is pretty cool. Nice. It was called the uh, Campania, and this ship had an amazing life. Okay, it was truly a very versatile ship. It was built, actually, it was built in Belfast, local ship. Uh, it was built, yeah. Anyway, I certainly it... trust any ship that's been built in Belfast, by the way. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> too soon, Great. I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a strong I'll allow history. It. <laughs> yeah. um, anyway, it was built in Belfast, but then, Second World War, it was uh, requisitioned by the military, uh, by the Navy, used as an export carrier. Okay, so it's now fine, it's a military ship. Saw some action in the Second World War. Then it was turned into the showboat for the Festival of Britain in 1951. Then it was refitted as the command ship for Operation Hurricane, which was the test of the first ever British atomic bomb. Okay. Wow. So it sailed to Australia and it, was the, it had some laboratories fitted and it did the test. It was the you know, main ship for that. And wow. then it was scrapped. So it had you know, what an interesting life for a ship, guys. Yeah. I feel like, <laughs> what I feel a like this microphone might not be. No, great story. <laughs> um. Um, the the, new, the uh, Northern Ireland part of the exhibition uh, was run by a guy with a brilliant name. He was called Willie DeMeo. Mm. Isn't that cool? Mm. Willie DeMeo. Uh, and the whole part of the, the whole point of the bit around Northern Ireland was to show the importance of hard work. Work, um, because Northern Ireland had made a really... Because someone in the UK had to work hard, <laughs> and it was down to you guys. Um, they worked out that Northern Ireland had made a much bigger, um, a much bigger part of the recovery after the war than anywhere else in the UK. Um, but they also had a lot of manufacturing on site because they wanted to show how many things were made here. So they had... Um, you could buy some festival cigarettes... Cool. They were made cool. while you watched. They made a cigarette and then you could smoke them. Nice. Um, they had some stuff about stockings, nylon stockings. And the way they showed those off is they had a load of sort of dismembered legs. They weren't real legs. They were like <laughs> kind of plastic legs and they were in the shape of a fan. And they all had stockings on them and they would spin round and round and round. And then there would be some nylon that you could kind of see through the spinning leg fan. Right. That's cool. Wow. Isn't that cool? That is cool. cool. I like there was, back in um, London, there was all these little other events that were going on. So you'd have the main features of the whole festival, which would be from theatre through to these caves that were built that were absolutely stunning. That these, they were like grottos, which looked mm. incredibly beautiful. Um, and then there was a French stunt tightrope walker called Eliano. Uh, I think that's the right pronunciation. And he walked across the Thames. So they put a tightrope up the whole way through. Uh, across wow. the Thames, and he walked it, and near the end, he almost fell, <gasps> and he went down onto one knee, and he stayed there for four minutes, and then he eventually got up, and then made it to the end, and it was a success, but it was particularly scary, because Eliano didn't know how to swim. <sighs> oh, no. <laughs> and had he had fallen, that could have been a horrific moment, but like, yeah, that's pretty bold, going across a giant body of water. Yeah. When you don't know how to swim. Well, it, people appreciated it. You can watch the footage of that. And yeah. 100,000 people were there. And that's a lot of people. It's like the, the entirety of London seemed to be rammed. I guess it was when you only had two channels on TV, so nothing else to do. And but, also no TV to watch them on. And yeah. no, yeah. when are we thing. with 51? Most people haven't got a TV. Well, there was, there was a big theatre there where people went to see television for the first time. It was yeah. the first time yes. seeing visuals, yeah. That's have you cool. seen just with the Eliano tightrope, have you seen what he does when he falls onto his knee? No. He mouths, well, according to one newspaper write-up, he's obviously doing something, and I don't know how the journalist could th see this, but he mouths to his wife, who is in the audience, who is also a tightrope walker, uh, I can't do this, the rope's too slack, I'm <sighs> going to fall, <sighs> you know, somebody help me. And she just shouted back, You've got to do it. You've got no choice. Come on, get up, mate. <laughs> wow. wow. And that kind of tough love is what does it. Yeah. yeah. That's um, so good. Have you heard of the, uh, the role that Laurie Lee... Laurie Lee is author of hmm. Cider with Rosie. Yeah, yeah. And... and? Go on. <laughs> and what's, the, what's the second famous book that Laurie Lee wrote? Biography of Laurie Lee. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, it yeah. was a memoir, so that kind of was the autobiography. Anyway, look, to the point... Um, <laughs> I was trying to help you out there. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Well, sorry. I'm biting the hand. Um, he, anyway, he was appointed the curator of eccentrics because they wanted to have some fun stuff. 
And um, he, applied, he sort of put an ad in the paper saying, send me stupid ideas and we'll build them and we'll put them in the exhibition of eccentric things. And he got brilliant suggestions, okay? And they built a lot of these things, which is really cool. So um, one that they didn't build is the deflatable rubber bus for going under low bridges. Oh, <laughs> brilliant. Um, Very good. The, brilliant. A machine which was 20 feet by 20 feet and its sole purpose was to blow out a single match held in front of it. Okay. That's a cool thing. Um, I love this one. A staircase which had weighted steps, okay? So you could give someone the feeling of going upstairs while they were actually going downstairs. Um, How cool what? is that? What? That's the no, dream. not very cool at all, is How it? Does... What? You're getting all the worst bit, basically, of going upstairs, and you're getting it when you're going downstairs. Yeah, but it would be useful... Um... When? <laughs> <laughs> It's good exercise, isn't it? Although if you could do the opposite and give the impression of sliding down a banister and then you end up on the second floor... <laughs> that would be amazing. That's the way to do it, yeah. If you had to trick someone yeah. to thinking that they were going upstairs when they were actually going downstairs... Yeah. Yeah. Why would you want to do that? You're a kidnapper. And... <laughs> Okay, I'm a kidnapper. To only the most obvious, you know. And I want them to think that they're in the top of a building, but yeah. they're actually in a basement. So that later on, when they say, where were you, where were you kept? The kidnap situation has been resolved, it's all fine. <laughs> <laughs> and they try and escape, but they're just going deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> They'll be asked, you know, where were you being kept? They say, well, I was upstairs. And so the police will be looking in places upstairs. Upstairs, you're right. You're in the cellar the whole time. And you've is this how they used this thing? <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> was this one of the main attractions of the Festival of Britain? All the kidnappers were running riot because the police were taking care of the kids, it's weren't the they? the Millennium Dome had stairs that you could feel like you were walking upstairs while you were walking downstairs. It would have been a runaway hit. <laughs> yeah, you're right. They, they also commissioned a lot of artists to do original mm. art as part of this. So they had famous artists building statues and so on. And one of the, one of the artists they got was Henry Moore. And he did a reclining figure. That was his, that was his piece. And there's a story that a small boy caught his head under one of the legs of the reclining figure and got stuck in there. And so the account was that they were pushing and pulling for ages, uh, trying to get this well, kid... Well, pushing and pulling isn't going to work. For, oh, from different ends, from I suppose different it ends, would. Yeah, yeah, they were just yeah. trying to... <laughs> yeah. Not just, like, for an hour, that you are pushing, right? No, I'm pulling. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you... <laughs> they shouldn't have got the Chuckle Brothers to do the extrication job. <laughs> Yeah, so what they did was they were just trying desperately to get him out. They couldn't get him out, so then they brought huge quantities of soap over and they started <laughs> soaping this boy up in order to get him up. Um, and they finally managed to... And they, they tried weird things, like um, they, the soap was like on his neck, it was on his body. Yeah. They finally pulled him up vertically and managed to pull him out that way. Um, sorry, sorry, they put him into a flat horizontal position and they managed to pull him out that way and they said it was like a missile from the breach of a gun, like he popped out. Um, and his mother reported that her son's neck had never been so clean. <laughs> These are the kind of japes that were happening at the there Festival There was another sculpture called um, Root Bodied Forth by someone called Mitzi Cunliffe. Uh, and this was a sculpture of two bodies entwined together as if they're coming out of the earth. So if you can imagine the bodies going round. Um, the person who was in charge of the Festival of Britain was called Sir Gerald Barry. And he had to go and look at this sculpture when it was being made because he'd been tipped off that it might be a study in sodomy. Mm. Uh, and he concluded that if it was a study in sodomy, then it was one that was anatomically impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I can't believe that takes a sort of someone professional to judge it. It seems like it'd be pretty obvious to most people if it's a study in sodomy or not. No, well, there, no, there's expertise in every field, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> you I think just, you're some kind of expert. <laughs> I just think we might all be experts in that. Fair looking enough. at it. <laughs> I'm all doing it. I'm not, I'm not judging, but I'm just saying to look at most of us. Can I t we should move on anyway. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I feel like this is your mammal gate, Anna. Uh, <laughs> um, no, it wasn't amazing. It was, but the craziest yeah. thing of all is yeah. that they, they spent something like £12 million on it at the time in the 50s. A huge amount of money. It was, it was funded by the Labour government. who were It was Clement Attlee who was in power at the time. Uh, there was a guy, Herbert Morrison, who kind of was seen to be the person who was going to succeed Attlee. Never actually did. His grandson is Peter Mandelson, I discovered. Oh, yeah. So it's like yeah. a yeah, history of staying in politics. But um, it went up uh, it went up in when was it? It was in 51. Yeah, 51, but it was in May 51, mm -hmm. I think it was. Yeah. Um, 
Churchill then didn't like it at all. So much money went in, it looked beautiful. And by September of that year... And he got back into office in exactly. that time. Exactly. Yeah, so he got back in yeah. in that time, and by September... They had it dismantled, this incredible yeah, thing. Yeah, they saw it as like an emblem of socialism and this great kind of... All of these amazing sculptures and buildings, they were kind of of the socialist government. And they're like, we're having none of that. Let's get rid of it. Yeah. It was jealous. Go. This is basically Lego Gate from my childhood when my brother managed to make the Lego pirate ship when I had failed and I got up in the middle of the night, went into his room and smashed it to pieces. <laughs> and that is what this was. <laughs> right. <laughs> And at least I'm adult enough to admit that. I bet Churchill never admitted that was Does what he was your, doing. Have you admitted it to your brother, or is he going to hear this podcast? <laughs> Fortunately, he doesn't listen to the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, very interesting, the dismantling of all this stuff. It was really hard to dismantle, because they had to do it quite quickly, and they were losing staff all the time. So they had like things like the single largest sheet of glass in the world at that point, because it was part of the telescope that they'd built. And they didn't know how to... They'd had to dismantle everything around it before they could get this sheet out. And they were right. losing people. They had a train from India, which they couldn't put on the railway to get back to its ship in time because it was the wrong gauge. Like, there were all these issues. And most things in there were really expensive. So you had these security guards who were bouncers basically protecting millions of pounds worth of items and inventions that were there. And one of the things that they had a lot of were dustbins, all the bins that were around for this place. And one person went and bought them all up, or most of them, and that was a guy called Billy Butlin, who runs Butlin's. <gasps> really? So if you ever oh. went to Butlin's in the late 50s and, and possibly through to now, the bins that you're putting your rubbish in are the bins that were at the Festival of Britain. Wait, you think that's they're still really the same cool. bins? I, I didn't find a photo well, of a recent bin. Yeah, <laughs> it <laughs> might be. be. I mean, they can't, you know, they don't get much wear and tear yeah. of bin, do Where they? are you going to throw them away, Anna? <laughs> 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 Look, we need to move on to our next fact. It is time for fact number two, and that is Andy. My fact is that in the 1990s, a British bank set up a computer system so they could write to all their wealthiest customers at once. Unfortunately, due to a rogue bit of placeholder text, they started sending out letters which began... Dear Rich Bastard. <laughs> so, this was, in, this was in a paper recently, and uh, the website Snopes, who do a lot of debunking and bunking, have um, to re you checked it out, and it did happen. It was written up in Computer Weekly at the time. Uh, it was a firm, a telecommunication firm. They were launching a new gold card, and they wanted to email the richest people all at once and see if they wanted to buy a new product. And so one of the programmers just wrote a bit of placeholder text. Normally the name of the customer would be in there, but some of the records were a bit botched and it couldn't read it. So he just said as a little joke to himself, this will never go out, but you know, it's going to be dear rich bastard. Anyway, he then left the project and <laughs> <laughs> it was handed on to a different programmer <laughs> who didn't know about this. <laughs> and uh, it was restarted. And so they started later sending out these letters yeah. to dear rich bastard. Allegedly, they got one complaint from a customer who hadn't been called dear rich bastard and was very offended. <laughs> <laughs> He'd been left dear off. poor bastard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it could have been yeah. sent to. Um, there was a British Royal Naval officer um, in 1798 called Richard Bastard. No! Could have gone to him, ah. Rich Bastard. There was also a Rich Bastard who was born in 1788 in Cornwall. Um, he <laughs> changed his name, actually, to Richard Bastian, and it seems to be he changed it just when he got married. He got married to a woman called Jennifer Sincock. <laughs> uh, and they became the Bastians. And the other rich bastard, the only other rich bastard I could find, a real rich bastard, is friend of the podcast, Seagar Bastard. Do you remember him? Yeah, what did he, he do? He was a football referee. Oh, yeah. Um, Seagar yes. Bastard, and his middle name was Richard, so he was Seagar Rich Bastard. Uh, and on his Wikipedia, there's a full paragraph on... It says, there is a popular belief that because of his name, Bastard was the inspiration behind the chant, who's the bastard in the black? And Wikipedia says, it is unlikely that he was the inspiration because the colour of the clothing he wore while refereeing is not documented. <laughs> and football chants did not include verbal aggression towards officials until at least the 1960s. <laughs> Long after he had died, so... Thanks, Wikipedia. Wow. Just <laughs> busting a myth there. <laughs> I love these big mail-outs where something goes wrong. I remember reading a story about a guy in Canada. He went on this date, and it was a really good date. And at the end of the date, he got given the number of this girl, Nicole, who liked, you know, possibly wanted to meet up again. Mm -hmm. So he gets home, and the next day he calls her, or, you know, in the next few days calls her, and it's the wrong number. 
So he's like, shit, she's, she's given me the wrong number by possibly one digit, I don't know. <laughs> but how do you find Nicole, you know, in the campus where he was, which was the University of Calgary? So what he did was he tracked down all 200 Nicole's email addresses and he sent out a group email to all the Nicoles, sort of individually, Christ. saying, are you the Nicole who gave me a number? I'm getting a few red flags here. <laughs> I don't know about anyone else. But, and, but what's amazing is the story became a bit big. A Facebook page was set up between all of the Nicoles, and they started becoming buddies. So all these new Nicoles were like a big Nicole clan all of a sudden, and they managed to find the one who he was looking for, and she did give the wrong number, and she did want to meet up with him again. Oh. So Yeah, yeah, so it wasn't like he was being... And she's now dead. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Pretty amazing. That is, uh, that's, yeah. it, it's maybe a nice story. Unexpectedly. It's, on, yeah. it's really on the edge between it's, creepy and romantic. It's so close, isn't Very it? Yeah. Romantic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, just on these sort of mass mailing things, I really like the, the, the errors that companies make because they do, it happens a lot. So there was a time in 2016, maybe someone in the room got one of these messages, I don't know. Uh, one person accidentally sent a test email to 840,000 people in the NHS. Oh, yeah. They accidentally did a oh, yeah, write that. to everybody. Yeah. One, person, one working age person in 40 in the country got an email. That was a flub, and it was obviously a big waste of, you know, it gummed up the computers. Unfortunately, they were all CC'd in, not BCC'd. So almost immediately, someone wrote saying, reply all, please take me off this mailing list. <laughs> so another 840,000 messages went out. And then obviously the funny people started kicking in. In, in a single hour and a quarter, 500 million emails were sent. <laughs> wow. The NHS had basically launched a crippling attack on its own computers. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't they actually, didn't it shut down for a while? I seem to remember yeah, that it, it, really it was so yeah. overloaded yeah, that yeah. it, yeah. I it's, understand it's so that's the, the Tory party is saying the fewer NHS staff we have, the less likely this will happen again. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the um, HBO sent a test, uh, sent an email round exactly like this to everyone that they shouldn't have done. It was everyone on their mailing list got yeah. this kind of test email. Uh, and someone wrote on Twitter that it happened, and then everyone on Twitter decided to share their stories of when they fucked up at work. Uh, some of them were really good. There was um, someone called at Aaron Chevy Ford, and they said that they'd made a PDF assigning each employee to the Muppet they reminded them of the most. <laughs> <laughs> they said, I meant to send it to my work friend, but I accidentally sent it to the entire company. <laughs> my supervisor, Beaker, <laughs> wanted to fire me, but the owners, Bert and Ernie, intervened. <laughs> so good. It's amazing, isn't it? I, and then uh, yeah. there, there was one person called yeah. Casey who, who also replied, and they said, I was using my desktop calendar to make a note of when I started my period, but after several <laughs> months realised I was doing it on a calendar I shared with the entire company. <laughs> <laughs> It's useful information, some would argue. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it's just, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, like, I like always imagining the behind the scenes when these stories come out, because uh, companies will do this and then send out an apology, say, whoopsie daisies, and then I just imagine the person getting furiously fired in the background. And <laughs> there was one in 2018. It was the US Embassy in Australia uh, sent out an email invitation to just all the big shot diplomats, politicians, journalists, and the invitation simply had a cat wearing pyjamas holding a box of cookies with the words... <laughs> cat pyjama jam and it went out to you know people at the highest levels of government and so the embassy sent a tweet out saying oh, ha, ha. sorry if you were looking forward to the pyjama party don't worry I'm afraid it's not going to happen it was a training error made by one of our new staff and then they followed it up by saying that new controls will now be implemented so something similar doesn't happen again. And you just know that that member of new staff, that one little intern, yeah. has made this mistake. And the new controls are that intern not being an intern anymore. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to move on, guys. So. Oh, uh, can I tell you a thing yeah, about um, autofill text, which is kind of what the oh, original yeah. fact is about. So there's a, there's a fake... Uh, text generator. Well, the fake Latin is called lorem ipsum, you yeah, know, when yeah, you just yeah. get... It just looks like a Latin sentence. It's not really. It's just chop, a, an old chopped up Latin text, basically, which looks like it's sentences, but it's not. Anyway, that's been established for hundreds of years, but there are new lorem ipsums all the time, and it's really exciting. There is office ipsum. You can get a Samuel L. Jackson ipsum. Um, and there's also, I really like, an online dating profile 
Lorem Ipsum, basically, a text generator which just generates a dating profile. So I just wondered if you fancied hearing a bit of it. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. If you plug it in, it just gives you this. Mountain biking, vampire weekend, exploring the city, Ethiopian. Down to earth, snowboarding, new friends, running shoes. Uh, if you think we have something in common, I'm pretty laid back, sleeping late, Kurosawa, I have a crush on. If you're <laughs> still reading this, my favorite word is sushi, passionate about making lasagna from scratch going to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, we need to move on yeah, to our okay. next fact. Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that when leaving the Norwegian military, soldiers must now hand over their used underpants and socks for the next recruit to wear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is <laughs> this like... is breaking news. Um, <laughs> it depends how you do it, doesn't it? It depends how you requisition those back. It's not like I'm going to need your gun, your badge, and your pants right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it used to be that you would give every other bit of clothing back. Oh, but um, you got to keep the pants. Yeah, you kept your pants and socks. But then, yeah, yeah, but then you know, it's been a hard time in the pandemic. So um, the Norwegian Defence Logistics Organisation spokespeople said that uh, with proper checks and cleaning, the reuse of garments is considered an adequate and sound practice. And so that's what it is now. You've got to hand back your. your and pants. I think it's fair because you hear used pants, and what you've heard is unwashed pants. And that's not what they're doing. They do wash them first, right? And do they also make them keep... You know, in a shop when you try on pants, you have to keep that um, plastic thing in the crotch bit. They make them wear that the whole time as well, don't they? What's that bit? <laughs> I'm not aware of this. this. You know when you go what? up and do a bit of stand-up and you're like, everyone will know what I'm talking <laughs> yeah. about here. Yeah. Hang what, on. What's <laughs> plastic? I don't, try, I don't try on pants much in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> Gen as in, I... Maybe you're not supposed to. You know what, it's when you're trying on... But actually, do you know what? It's when you're trying on bikini bottoms. Right. So, does anyone know what I mean? The sticky bit? That sounded yeah. like a lot of female voices. <laughs> there. <laughs> it's a distinctly female voices there. Yeah. Anyway, the plastic sticky thing. It's really useful if you don't want to get stuff dirty. Just cover it in plastic sticky stuff. And then you don't even need to use deodorant. Wait, so you wear... Wait. You wear... <laughs> Are you, have, you you wear have you laminated your pants? Yeah. That's what I'm... <laughs> I've lamin everything I'm wearing is la laminated right now. I feel like we're all learning so much about each other tonight, <laughs> specifically. It's really... It's, this happens a lot in, um, in armed forces. There are lo lots of stories about what happens with their pants policy. So, um, for example, the Swiss Army, uh, of knife fame, they only... <laughs> well, um, they only allow their female recruits to wear women's pants in 2021 which is very recent for that uh, shift of policy to have been made. Until then, women were just issued with standard underwear, which was yeah. men's pants. I think, what? I think they wouldn't have been stopped. They weren't checking whether they were wearing women's underwear. It was just they weren't given no. women's underwear as part of their uniform. Yes, oh, okay. that's true. But so, that's still, that's, uh, you know, they're yeah, not no, sort yeah, of being amazing. made to feel welcome with this kind of stuff. So anyway, they've launched a trial uh, this year where women actually now get women's pants, and they're, they're convinced this is going to be a big draw for recruitment. Cool. I'm not. Hey, <laughs> or a small draw. It depends oh, on your so, size, okay, right? Yeah. Is there but a lot yeah, of because... chat between the women going, what's this plastic thing that's on the inside? <laughs> but at the moment, it's only 1% of the Swiss army is women. And right. they're hoping by 2030 it'll be 10%, just, just due to this pants thing. Sure. Really? Yeah, maybe. Oh. If they told more of the women about the corkscrew on the knives, I'm telling you, they get a lot more recruits. <laughs> uh, what do you guys think that commandos wear underneath their trousers? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press the button and say nothing at all. No, that is the QI klaxon. Um, they wear nappies, basically. Um, nappies known as blast pelvic protectors. Okay. Well, uh, it is a, it's which, a scary job, isn't which it? Which direction is the blast coming from? <laughs> <laughs> it's to stop external blast from coming in rather than the internal blast okay. from going out. Um, but it's because, basically, if there's, like, an explosion or yeah. a mine or something like that, you might get some shrapnel, yeah. uh, and you have a lot of very important arteries, apart from everything else that's down there. You, yeah. you know, if you get a bit of shrapnel in your upper thigh, then you're done for. And so they all have these, what they call, nappy protectors, uh, and oh. they put those things up. We're not sure why Going Commando comes from, where it comes from. Uh, according to the OED, it probably is just because commandos are really brave and hardcore and... It's like, it was like American school slang, college slang, and they're like, well, if you don't wear pants, you're as hardcore as a commando. Mm. Uh, but then there is some interviews with commandos. There was an interview with um, Lee West, who is a commando, and he said that they would 
take off their pants um, because if they didn't, then there would be bacteria cultivated and their balls might drop off. <laughs> what? That's what he said. That's he not. also said sometimes <laughs> they might like go into an area and then they would leave a pair of soiled pants to taunt the enemy. And so when they <laughs> came away, they wouldn't be wearing any what pants are these underneath. Frat boys, what's this? <laughs> yeah, it's the most serious. Like, Why are hey, you? Great news, we've got Osama bin Laden. Right, you, <laughs> Private Smith, get your pants off. <laughs> what's the? Wow. Why did they think that? What, why would being a commando make your balls any more likely to drop off in pants yeah. than anyone else? Jungle That's... territory is uh, the thing. Uh, possibly it would have started around the Korean War or the Vietnam War, perhaps. Mm. Mm. It does, the, Brit the British Army do have. They have special antimicrobial pants. Yeah, do. and you can wear them for months on end. Because if you're deployed somewhere where you're going to be for months on end, I suppose it's, it's useful. Yeah. So that's, yeah. They could have yeah. just had that little bit of plastic and they wouldn't have had to do that. <laughs> yeah. It feels like a missed trick. <laughs> just laminate that shit. Um, the British Army has a combat cod piece. <laughs> really? Very oh. similar to this nappy, yeah. They started issuing them in 2010. And it's actually a three-tier a three -tier system. So they have... Uh, it's basically special detective, special detective underwear. It solves crimes. <laughs> It's special protective underwear against um, explosives, missiles, stuff like that. And the <laughs> missiles. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredibly if it, if, powerful. If the army's ever up against someone who fires <laughs> missiles at individual soldiers' cocks, <laughs> I say we surrender. I thought when you said it was a combat nappy that it was the other way around, as in it was like there was a gun down there that could fire. <laughs> That would be cool, a little bit like uh, Liz Hurley's nipples in Austin yeah, Powers. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And yeah. in the phrase, you could say, oh, is that a gun in your... Yo, it is a gun in your yeah, pocket. Okay. Okay. Um, it wasn't nappy. I didn't say nappy because it sounds more sexy than the ones James is talking about. It's the combat cod piece. A cod and piece. it's actually made up of ballistic silk, Ooh. which sounds wow. like a really hmm. angry silk. Yeah. But, and then it has, it's one layer of ballistic <laughs> silk, and then it's one layer of detachable armoured modular trousers. It sounds like something out of Wallace and Gromit, but apparently it's crucial in Afghanistan. Wow. wow. <laughs> I've devised a little game for us to play. Oh, oh great. Oh, it's like, you know, the um, play your cards right, where you had to bid higher or lower. It's that, basically, but with celebrity underpant auctions. <laughs> okay. 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 So, um, Eva Braun. Yes. Guess how much her pants went for. Hitler's better half. Uh, we just, so just to, um... <laughs> pounds. We're going to go in pounds. Here. Yeah, please. Right, okay. Uh, 6,000 pounds. 3,700. All right, now we get into the higher or lower bit because I was just setting you up with that one. Oh, right, okay. Sorry. So if you, if you thought that wasn't exciting enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Queen Victoria, higher or lower? Higher. Higher, because they were huge, weren't they, Queen Victoria? Absolutely right. It's not, done on, it's not done on acreage, but yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> they were bigger. 12,090 pounds. Okay, they were dead. Right, Michael Jordan, next up. Uh, higher. Higher. Lower. James is right. Ugh. Michael Jordan's pants went for 2,400 quid Queen in 2021. Queen Victoria or Michael Jordan? Michael Come Jordan, on, greatest basketball player of all, all time. Recent. All right, yeah, all right, but all right. Queen Victoria, Queen of England, probably not that good at basketball, but good at lots of other things. <laughs> they thought it was going to be boring. They're fighting over this now. <laughs> Elvis Presley, next. Higher. Up, lower. He never wore underwear. Trick question. <laughs> <laughs> he did wear them, and they did not sell. Uh -huh. oh. Can you believe that? They were up for auction, and they didn't sell. Why Are they the they... ones he pooed himself in? Because he did poo himself in... Didn't he poo himself? Well, he died, he died on the toilet. Yeah. Are they his death pants? No, so... I don't think... Because <laughs> no one wants the death pants. Yeah. I don't think they're his death pants, but they were a little marked. But they... <laughs> oh, come on. I said marked. What do you want? They were macchiato. Look, whichever way you want to phrase it, they were, they were not pristine. Okay. And that may have been the reason they didn't sell. I doubt it. <laughs> Elvis fans. Oh, skid marks from Elvis? Yeah, but they didn't sell. Yeah, probably because they didn't meet the reserve price, which would be higher. Next question. <laughs> I've written Hermann Goering, and I then didn't write down the price that they went for. <laughs> You'd never have got that from Brucey. <laughs> Did you, do you know who makes British Army bras? Um, ooh, uh, no. no. Um, a, a sort of, Victoria's uh, classic, Secret. Marks and Spencer. Um, <laughs> no. Two, two ends of the spectrum yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Just shows your different tastes, and that's fine. <laughs> uh, well, they only started being issued bras in 2021. It's a uh, booby doo. Booby doo. <laughs> booby doo. <laughs> the company Booby Doo supplies the bras really? for the British Army now. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It would have taken us a while to get that, I yeah. reckon. Yeah. I did. It would. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is Anna. My fact is that it takes two to four months to train a dog to keep still in an MRI scanner. <laughs> Yeah, I, I found this out recently. I was just reading about a study that did some brain scans on 18 dogs, a whole range of dogs. And I thought, well, how, I wonder how that works because, you know, one knows people who've been in MRI scanners, lots of us probably have, and you have to keep pretty bloody still. So I looked it up, and there's a study in 2018 titled Clinical Findings in Dogs Trained for Awake MRI. And yeah, they've, they've researched this properly, and there's a specific trainer actually called Marta Gacci who described the process, and it takes between 5 and 20 sessions without the scanner. So before you're even entering the room with the scanner, you've got to get the dog used to keeping it's still. It's easier to get them into a cat scan. It's... <laughs> no, you've, you've become Now, abused. come on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that you, you introduce them to the scanner. You can't food train them with treats because you can't give a treat to a dog in a scanner because that ruins the whole thing. You have to start again. They're not even allowed to lick their lips. So they have to sit still for, what, like 10, 15 minutes? And if a dog so much as drools... So this is why you can't food train them wow. because if a dog is waiting for a treat, right. they start to salivate. Uh -huh. And if they're in the MRI scanner and starting to salivate, then they start to dribble a bit, then they lick their lips, then they've fucked it up, and you don't get the crucial brain scan. I'm, uh, not, I'm not sure I could go 10 to 15 minutes without licking what? my lips. <laughs> Genuinely. Yeah. And I, I'm a very creepy guy, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> But everyone's got their threshold. I was going to say, do you know someone else who can't stay still in MRI scanners? And that is men. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah because when you look at... When you put a man and a woman in an MRI scanner, the man will almost always move around more than the woman. Right. Really? And that means that you're not getting correct readings from each person. And it means that a lot of the studies that have been done between men and women in MRI scanners might not be 100% true because the men are wiggling around so much. Okay. Why, and why are they wiggling? Because they're men. What do you guys do? Why, why do men wiggle? They're probably adjusting themselves. <laughs> yeah, possible. I don't know. I'm in there licking my lips all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the dog thing, they found out quite a lot of interesting stuff about dogs as a result of the yeah. ones they managed to get in there. And one thing that they found out was that dogs really genuinely love us as humans. Like, they properly... The bits of their brain that activate when bits of them are reminded of us while they're in there. So there's, oh. like, if aromas are brought in... If there's a human aroma that comes in, it activates this sort of reward center, it's called, where it sort of shows that they're like, oh my God, it's my owner, this is so exciting. And, and that's a connection that we realize is a real thing now. Because you always think, if a dog notices, for example, if you're feeling a bit moody, or you think, oh, the dog is picking up on my sympathy, it's not that it's just noticing and changing. It's, look, it's genuinely concerned for you. It, it can okay. follow your emotions. And that's, that's what they were looking at. And even if there was a group of aromas, they found that the dog would try and prioritize finding the human smell within that just to be like, yeah, my, my owner's here, or a human I know is here. How pathetic is it that... <laughs> <laughs> what a nice story you had, Dan. We... Yeah. Sorry, that's lovely, blah, blah, blah. But how pathetic is it that mm. humans have gone to all the trouble of making this extraordinary machine just to absolutely make sure that dogs love us? <laughs> Like the clues were all there from them wagging yeah. their tails. They're excited when we come home. Let's just go try. I don't think that was the primary reason it, it was, for the building it was of the MRI. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. Just quickly, right. do you know that there are no, almost no guide dogs called Neil? <laughs> <laughs> almost none. I can't guarantee there are none because I haven't really checked, but you know. Is that... Are there any called Fletch? Exactly. This is why. So, probably not. Yeah. Because. You, can't, you shouldn't name a guide dog after very common commands or something that sounds like a very common command. So Neil sounds like heel. Fletch sounds like fetch. Kit shouldn't be chosen because it sounds like sit. Ah. So there are all sorts of names. Anyway, Neil that's also sounds like Neil. I don't know why you didn't go for that. <laughs> that's Paris what says, I uh... thought. But then when you were saying that, I was thinking, did, did dogs kneel down? Yeah, sure. you, what is the, you... What's the common dog command saying, Neil? Ah, you... Remember, I mean, I can't the think of it. Prove that you love me. Prove yeah. that you love me. Kneel down now. <laughs> I can't think of dogs specifically in this, but think of the opening scene of The Lion King when Simba's lift up and they all go down to sort of... Okay, again, again, I'm sure... No, right. Simba is a fucking cat, no, not a dog. I, 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 well, to be fair, they're both mammals. They are mammals. <laughs> I and preface that. that by saying I'm not sure there were dogs in that scene. I'm just <laughs> saying... We there do know hyenas. they do it. Animals, they do do it. <laughs> they do do it. And it has but it's not a common dog. It's like, fetch, roll over, sit. 
There's it no has eel. recently become quite popular for dogs to take the knee out of respect sometimes. <laughs> it has. <laughs> it's not very up to yeah. speak with it. At football matches. <laughs> dogs yeah. Before crufts, before it starts, they all take the knee, they don't do. they? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my um, God. Have you guys heard of the 20-inch high club? Certainly have. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly have. <laughs> Go on. The, the 20-inch high club is for people, a very elite group of people, a small group, who have had sex in a model In a model plane? No. No. <laughs> yeah. no, in one of those planes in a children's like, uh, shopping centre. <laughs> <laughs> Pop another pound in, love. <laughs> <laughs> um, elite. <laughs> this elite club. Go it's on. a very small group of people who have had sex inside of an MRI scanner. And the oh, reason really? it's called the 20 inch uh, high club is because that's the height and space of the yeah, yeah. hole that you go into. <laughs> <laughs> Crikey. <laughs> that the couple go into. Those pe the initial people who first. Uh, Help that study. It was a scientist from the University of Groningen. Actually, we've we've oh, played yeah. a game in Groningen, and it was he was called a lot Willy... of Groningen going on oh, there. Hey, right? hey. <laughs> Willy Broad Weimar Schultz was the scientist, and he scanned a couple. But it was very hard to do. It was very hard to get the couple to get the images they needed because this was what you had to do. You had to hold perfectly still for a complete minute, and that's quite hard to do. The only couple who were able to do it were amateur street acrobats. And so they had the experience and really? flexibility to, right. to get that right. To hold still during sex for a minute? For a minute. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got to say, this podcast is going to be about 12 minutes long <laughs> when it goes out. <laughs> Should we? <laughs> there was... No, <laughs> can I, okay, can I tell you about one other study in this yeah, broad yeah, area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a study... A writer, Why not? Kate, Kate Sukel, she was called. She was writing a book about science and sex, and she had to, the, the study that was being done on her, she had to have an orgasm inside an MRI machine. Okay? Uh -huh. But, you know, by herself. Um, and, but as, as Anna uh, and Dan have said, the, the thing is you have to be very still inside the MRI machine, and it's very hard. And so like training the dogs to be incredibly still, <laughs> she had to train herself. And this was the mechanism. She wrote an article in The Guardian all about it. Amazing, you know, account. She said she wasn't quite sure she could manage to get all the way there uh, under those incredibly still circumstances. Because she, she had to be in a helmet which was screwed to the bed, so incredibly still. <laughs> um, but she managed it. She managed the training program by attaching a small bell, which belonged to her cat, to her forehead with some duct tape, and then practiced getting there with the minimum jingling possible. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> so she... She I don't strapped understand. Her, she strapped her cat's bell to her forehead yeah, with yeah, duct tape. Yeah, I got tape, that bit. Yeah. And then practiced having an orgasm without hearing the bell go once. Oh. To stay st oh, so that I she see. then stays That was the practicing before she came in. Before she went into she the machine, She wasn't turned yeah. on by cat bells. <laughs> I mean, by the end of this process, yeah. she probably was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, wow, that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> Have you guys heard of um, Dr. Didge? No. This is a guy called Graham Wiggins, and he helped to develop the technology for MRI scanners. Okay, so without him, we wouldn't have all of the really sharp images that we have today. Uh, and most of his Wikipedia page is down to a type of didgeridoo that he invented, um, which has got keys in it. Okay, Ooh. he invented it out of cardboard wrapping paper tube, and he only made one of them. He used it for one gig, and it fell apart. <laughs> Um, but then he later on um, played with the Grateful Dead, playing the didgeridoo. Cool. He's like an amazing didgeridoo player, but he also was one of the main people behind inventing the MRI scanner. You can definitely oh, wow. see the relationship between a didgeridoo and an MRI scanner. You just hope that the MRI scanner doesn't fall apart after one go. Because <laughs> of the what? noise that it makes. Because you go in stuff. a big tube and there's a big noise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Big, horrible sound. You can get, you know... Um, F MRI scanners, so that's functional MRI mm. scanner, scanners. Yeah. They're for your brain. Okay. But you can also get a non-functional MRI scanner. There's one of these at the University of Michigan, 
Uh, and what the point of this is, is you go in and it doesn't do anything it's supposed to do, but it makes all the noises that an MRI scanner makes. So it kind of makes an MRI scanner, if you've ever been in one, it makes this really kind of, it's, the mag magnets are really, really strong and it's like this banging and wah, wah, all this really, really loud noise. <laughs> That's a didgeridoo. <laughs> 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 and people feel like they can sometimes, some people actually can make out a tune. Like their brain turns this really weird noise into a kind of tune. Oh, cool. Oh. And if you want to study that, it, you can't just put loads of people in an MRI scanner because there's too much, you know, electromagnetism mm. and stuff. And so they need to put them in this fake MRI scanner, which has all the noises, and you can see what's going on with people. Wow. Oh, wait, wow. but if it's fake, then you can't see what's going on in their brains because it's fake, right? Yeah, so it's more experience. They're not looking at their brains. It's the experience. Oh, I see. Okay. That's the okay. other thing. You know the um, ASMR that oh, yeah. people report um, about having? If they, so that's the idea that if you watch a video on um, YouTube of someone ironing, it gives you a sort of brain fuzz, like well, that, goosebumps around your it's head. Any, or, it's any noise that's... Yeah. Uh, or some people, they say, I'm whispering now and I'm, I'm rubbing the cloth between my fingers. Oh, and that kind of... Some people uh, listening to this are like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> but so that's an it's interesting very, thing. Very that's, sense, it gives some people a really, yeah. Exactly, yeah. It's and they're yeah. trying to work out what it is in the brain that does that. So obviously an MRI scanner is the way to find that out. Unfortunately, it's too noisy in there to even begin that uh, because it just breaks yeah. the spell of it. So we can't work out what it is yet. As Shit, a what a terrible loss to medicine that will never know why people get turned on by weirdos whispering to them on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I guess we'll just have to keep curing cancer. <laughs> um, guys, I'm going to have to wrap us up. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're, we're out of time. Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. James. At James Harkin. And Anna. You can email podcast at qi.com. Yep, or you can go to our group account, which is at no such thing, or our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of our previous episodes are up there. Do check them out. Uh, but until next time, Belfast, thank you so much for having us. We will be back. That was awesome. Everyone else listening at home, thank you for listening. We'll be back again next week. We'll see you then. Goodbye. <laughs> 